and maybe you've read that you should count sheep, I have a suggestion for you. If you have any word of God in your spirit, meditate on it. I practice my memorization at night sometimes before I go to sleep. I've discovered something that I don't know how to explain, but your mind is more fertile in remembering just before you go to sleep than maybe any other time in the day. Now, you wouldn't know that by looking at people who fall asleep in church, but that's true. <laughs> so when I'm laying on my bed at night and my head's on my pillow and everything is quiet, I think through the passage I'm memorizing. And what a blessing that is. Sometimes that happens in the morning. Sometimes I wake up before anybody should wake up, and I know I better not get up. So I just lay in bed, and I meditate on the Word of God. Robert Morgan has a great definition of meditation. He says, it's the powerful practice of pondering, personalizing, and practicing Scripture. I recently read a story about actor Anthony Hopkins who, when he gets a movie script, reads through it between 100 and 200 times before production. He makes notes in the margins of the script. He scribbles and doodles and imagines how it would look on the stage or the screen. And by the time Hopkins is finished, he has internalized that script. He knows his character. He knows his and everybody else's lines, and he's able to improvise, and he's a personification of the script. That's an amazing thought. Matt Gardner, who wrote the story about Hopkins, said, if a Hollywood actor reads a script a hundred times, why can't I read a book in the Bible a hundred times? He selected the book of James, which, by the way, you can read in ten minutes. And he began to read it over and over and over again and meditate on what he was reading. As he got into the project and the days passed, he began to see how certain themes emerged and were repeated in the book. He began to get a sense of the author's personality and convictions. He became so familiar with this epistle, he could think through it with his eyes closed, and he began looking at his everyday life through the lens of the book of James. Just read the book of James. It takes 10 minutes. What if you read it 100 times or 200 times like Anthony Hopkins? You'd pretty much know everything that's in that book. And I want to tell you, the book of James is one of the most practical books in the Bible. It will hit you everywhere in your life and help you become a better person. On a lighter note, I read this about Elmer Towns, an old friend of mine, who knew an office manager who liked everything about her job except one thing. She didn't enjoy interacting with the plant manager, and she had to have meetings with the plant manager all the time. No matter what happened in the company, she'd have to go see the plant manager, and it was very negative, and she dreaded being called into his office. So she had a discussion with Dr. Towns about it, and he suggested that she meditate on the Lord's Prayer. He said, on your way to the office to meet with the plant manager, just recite the Lord's Prayer. Just pray it over and over again. Can you imagine this lady walking down the hallway to her manager's meeting, and she's mumbling the Lord's Prayer on her way? It's like she's going to an execution or something. <laughs> but she decided to do it, and she said when she did that, by the time she arrived at his office, she was calm. She wasn't defensive. She wasn't angry with him. She was even able to say, let me help you get a better perspective on this. She later said, I got faith from the Lord's Prayer. It gave me courage to aggressively suggest new ways for him to look at things. Now I always say the Lord's Prayer when I'm walking from my desk to his office. Meditates on the Word of God day and night. The Bible isn't something you just carry to church with you on Sunday and throw it into the back window shelf in your car till seven days go by. The Bible should be the source of your strength. The Bible says their heart delights in the Word of God. Now notice, not only does their heart delight in it, but their habits are dictated by it. Their strength comes from the Word of God. The psalmist says, he shall be like a tree. A tree is a picture of a man in this psalm. Just as a tree is nourished by constant supplies of water without which it would die in the blistering sun, 
So the strength of a godly man is maintained by the supplies of grace that are drawn from the Word of God. How do you stay strong in your life? Don't try to do it on your own. Get strength from the Word of God. Number two, their strength comes from the Word of God, and their stability comes from the Word of God. Notice the text says, planted by the rivers of water. A fruit tree that is planted by the banks of the river suggests stability. The tree is firmly rooted in the soil so that when the storm comes, the root system is so vast down into the soil that the storm does not destroy the tree. How many of you know Christians who get destroyed by unexpected storms because they don't have stability? Their relationship with the Lord Jesus is one half inch deep. And so when the storm comes, their root system is right on the top, and the storm just takes them off of their game. Do you know that in America today, there are trees still standing that have lived through the entire history of this nation? Remaining strong and fresh and green, just as they were at the beginning. The Bible says when we become aware of the importance of sinking our roots down deep into the soil of God's Word, we become strong and we become stable. Here's the third one. Our spiritual testimony comes from God's Word. Now, if you're examining a plant, the first thing that you see about that plant or that tree that gives you any indication of how the tree is doing is the leaf. The Scripture says, whose leaf also shall not wither. (laughs) The leaf is the outward testimony of this man. As someone has said, God's trees are evergreens. They never lose their testimonies. (laughs) They never wither. Why does the leaf not wither? Because of the connection. It is connected with the branch, which is connected to the tree, which is fed by the roots, which go down deep near a river of water, which is the Word of God. There is much talk today about the blown testimonies of God's people. I hate to tell you how many I have watched just in this last year who started out right and it looked like they were going to make a huge difference in the kingdom, and somehow it's all over and they're finished. Let me tell you what I know. That didn't happen overnight. I think I didn't go to bed one night really full of the Word of God and the desire to serve Him and get up the next morning and go out and do something that totally discounted everything they supposedly believed. I remember years ago hearing Chuck Swindoll as he was talking about marriage, and he said, if you get into a marriage that's coming unglued, let me tell you, it's not a blowout. It's a slow leak. <laughs> And that's the way it is in our Christian life, is it not? We don't become ungodly in a moment, but we allow the downward gravitational pull that we have just discussed, the counsel and the path and the seat, we allow those things to drag us away from the centrality of walking with God. And the next thing we know, our testimony is gone. The leaf does not wither if it stays connected. And you will not wither if you stay connected. Connected with God and His Word, God and His people, God and His church. Their strength comes from God's Word. Their stability comes from God's Word. Their spiritual testimony comes from God's Word. And their success comes from God's Word. I see your ears perk up when I say that. We all want to be successful. And that is what the Scripture says. That brings forth its fruit in its season, and whatever he does shall prosper. Prosperity for the believer, it's like the zero that comes after a numeral. Outward prosperity is wonderful if it follows after God, just like a zero that is added to the number one. But if you don't have the number one before your zeros, you are just a row of goose eggs. (laughs) God is the number one. Success starts with God. If you try to build a successful life without God, you're going to end up with a bunch of ciphers, 
And at the end, you're going to be so frustrated that you gave your life to that, and all you got left is a bunch of zeros. But the psalmist says that the happy man has success in his own time, and whatever he does prospers. Why? Because he's connected to the source, the true source, which is God. That's how the psalmist describes the way of the godly man. Notice the transitional statement in this text. But the ungodly are not so. The way of the ungodly is unfolded for us in verses 4 through 6. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Take everything that I've said today about the righteous and negate it. That's the ungodly. That's what the psalmist means when he says, the ungodly are not so. Are the ungodly blessed? Not so. Are they happy? Not so. Are they successful? Not so. Are they fruitful? Not so. They may sound gregarious and look successful, but they are not so. The ungodly actually do what God forbids in verse 1. They walk in the counsel of the wicked, they stand in the way of sinners, and they sit in the seat of the scornful. And the ungodly cannot stand in the time of difficulty. Verse 4 says, The ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Now that's a statement that doesn't resonate with us because we don't know anything about the chaff. So let me tell you where this illustration came from. The picture here is of a threshing floor in Israel at the time of the grain harvest. The threshing floors of Palestine were built on hills that would catch the best breeze. The grain is brought to them. It is crushed by animals or by threshing instruments that are drawn over it. Then the grain is pitched high into the air where the wind blows the chaff away, and the heavier grain then falls back down to the threshing floor, and it is collected. The chaff is scattered, or it's burned. And the psalmist says that the person who walks in wickedness is like the chaff which the wind blows away. Get this. You are either like a strong tree that is embedded with its roots into the riverbed, or you're like the chaff which is being blown away by the wind. The ungodly cannot stand in the time of difficulty when the wind comes because there's no substance, there's no source. The ungodly cannot stand in the day of judgment. That's the next thing we learn about them. They cannot stand in the time of difficulty, nor can they stand in the day of judgment. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The psalmist means that wicked men cannot hold up in the day of judgment. They cannot stand. They will be convicted. They will shrink away. When the psalm speaks of sinners not standing in the congregation of the righteous, it is just repeating the principle, wicked men today live in a world which is peopled with many righteous ones. God calls these righteous ones the salt of the earth. But God is not going to allow both classes of people to be together throughout eternity. And how awful it will be to be in eternity to live forever with those who are just as wicked as you are never seeing a righteous person, never hearing a righteous word, never witnessing a righteous act. Say all you want to about hell and its fire. This is hell, and this is what it will be like for eternity to those who do not come to God. The ungodly cannot stand in the time of difficulty. They cannot stand in the day of judgment, and they cannot stand in the presence of God. Listen to verse 6, the final word of Psalm 1. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. That doesn't mean he's acquainted with us. The word know is the word for intimacy. The Lord is intimate with the righteous. 
And the word is in a continuing nuance. The Lord continually knows the way of the righteous. Ladies and gentlemen, God knows us when we're trying to live for him, walking on the road that he puts us on. He doesn't abandon us. He knows us. He sees us. He keeps knowing the way of the righteous. His eye is upon us. His ear is open to us. And in Christ, his spirit lives within us. But the way of the wicked, says the psalmist, will perish. The ungodly sinner, judged and condemned in the final judgment, will suffer relentless torment, forever suffering the eternal wrath of God. Hear me carefully. The word perish does not mean annihilation. The Bible does not teach that the wicked will be annihilated. I've heard people say, yeah, I'm going to live my life the way I want to, and if what you say is true when I die, I will just die like a dog, and that'll be it, and it'll be over. Not so. Everybody in this room, everybody in this world is going to be alive forever somewhere. The road you get on will determine the destiny at which you arrive. But don't let anybody tell you that perishing means annihilation. To, be, to perish means to be separated from God. Now, this is all very challenging. It's like much of the Bible for me. The Bible says, blessed is the man. Then it describes how this blessed man lives. And I go through this, and I think, you know, I do some of that, and some of it I don't. How does anybody live like that? I remember reading a story about a man named Joseph Flax, who was visiting Palestine in the early 20th century. And he had an opportunity to address a gathering of Jews and Arabs. And he decided to speak on the psalm that I've spoken on today, Psalm 1. So he read it in Hebrew, and then he asked, Who is this blessed man of whom the psalmist speaks? This man who never walked in the counsel of the wicked, or stood in the way of sinners, or sat in the seat of the scorners. Who is this man? And nobody spoke. And so Flack said, Was it our great father Abraham? And a man stood up and he said, No, it cannot be Abraham. Abraham denied his wife and told a lie about her. Well, how about the lawgiver Moses, said Flack. No, someone said, it cannot be Moses. He killed a man, and he lost his temper by the waters of Meribah. And then Flack suggested David. Could it be David? It was not David, said someone, because he committed adultery and he committed murder. And there was a long silence. And then an elderly Jew stood up and said, My brother, I have this little book here. It's called the New Testament. I've been reading it. And if I could believe this book, if I could be sure that it is true, I would say that the man of the first psalm is Jesus of Nazareth. Which tells me that you and I we don't have any hope of living life on this high road in our own energy. This very calling is consummated by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is he who lives in perfect communion with his Father. It is he who delights in the Word of God. It is he who prospers in all his way. In Christ, we become the blessed person of Psalm 1. He is the God-man who fulfills the divine command it is he who gives us his righteousness. And as we live in communion with him, we can become that tree planted by the waters. And our way will be known to the Lord. And as we live in communion with him, his psalms become our psalms. And the road to happiness, to blessing, is ours because, first of all, it is his. And we are in Christ. And I will just leave you with two takeaway applications. If this psalm says anything, it says that for us to stay on the right road and not get on the detours that so often appeal to us, even as Christians, two things we need to be proactive about. First of all, stay in the written word. Read the word. Ten minutes a day for the whole book of James. 
And here's the second thing. When you're in the written word, don't forget that the written word is all about the living word. Jesus is called the word of God. We don't study the living word unless we really understand that the reason we study the written word is so we can get to better understand the living word. Here's a good illustration. When I was in college, after my junior year at Cedarville, I had just met Donna. We kind of had fallen in love, and we were talking about getting married after graduation. But I was in a, I know this is going to take a lot of faith, I was in a quartet, and we traveled for a whole summer, and we sang at churches all across the Midwest, a different church every night, pulled a U-Haul trailer behind us with all our luggage, and some of our guys played instruments, and so when I said goodbye to Donna, and she went home to work in Cleveland to make enough money to come back to the college, and I went off on this tour, and we wrote letters to each other every single day. I know that sounds probably not true, but it's true. In fact, I have those letters hidden in a safe place. No, you can't ever see them. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. Listen to me. Listen to me. Every time we got to a church, all the guys would get out of the car and they'd go on to see what kind of an auditorium it has. Not me. I went straight to the office to see, did you get any mail? Did you get any mail? And when they would give me the letter, I'd get off of the, out of the way. I'd find some quiet corner and I'd sit down. You know what? I didn't read that letter to see what kind of grammar she used. I read that letter because in that letter was Donna. In that letter was the person I loved and loved deeply today. When I come to this book, which is the letter of God, I read it, I examine it, I outline it. But men and women, this is God's love letter to me and to you. And once we understand that and we begin to look at the written word, we will see the living word just as we did today. Who could imagine finding Jesus in Psalm 1? But he's there. In fact, he's everywhere throughout all of the scripture if you just look for him. If you want to stay happy, if you want to be blessed, blessed, happy, happy, my counsel to you is stay in the written word so you can find the living word and fall in love with him all over again. And you will discover, blessed is that man. Dr. Jeremiah will return to close today's program right after this. Thank you for watching today. When you support this program with a gift of any amount, Dr. Jeremiah would like to thank you by sending you daily in his presence, his new 365 day devotional for 2020. Each day's short reading in this beautiful leather-bound devotional provides scripture and a spiritual thought to encourage you, challenge you, and focus your attention on God so you can experience God's will in your life and enter into the company of the Savior. This devotional is also perfect for sharing with others. And with a generous year-end gift of $120 or more in support of this program, you will receive a four-pack of Daily in His Presence so that you can give your loved ones a copy and help them walk ever closer to God in the coming year. Your support helps this program continue on this station and keeps the ministry on firm financial footing into the new year. Contact Turning Point today. And now, with one last word for today's program, here is Dr. Jeremiah. I've always loved the opening... Welcome to an Easter celebration with Dr. David Jeremiah.
Dr. Jeremiah wants to guide you on the path that will take you from fear to fear not in his book, Hope, Living Fearlessly in a Scary World. His message, the path to hope and to fearless living is a well-trodden one that you will take many times in your life. So it is best to learn how to walk it well. Inside this book, he does just that, directing you to take your first step to fear not, past the top seven fears holding many of us back. If you need hope, if you want to experience the providential power of our God, who controls even the smallest details of your life, then learn to move from fear to fear not in Hope by Dr. Jeremiah. Yours when you give a gift of any amount in support of this program. And if you give $65 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will send you the Living Fearlessly set, which contains his book, his current teaching series, What Are You Afraid Of? on your choice of CD or DVD, and a correlating study guide. Plus the Fear to Fear Not bookmark, a powerful reminder containing scripture to help you travel each day down the path from fear to fear not. Hope and the Living Fearlessly set, yours when you give a generous gift to support the ministry of Turning Point today.
coming up on Turning Point. And it's that Son of God who stands before all of us today with his arms wide open and say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you in a place in your life where you need hope? Dr. Jeremiah wants to teach you how to move from fear to fear not in his book, Hope, Living Fearlessly in a Scary World. In its pages, Dr. Jeremiah explores the top seven fears holding so many of us back as he shares practical lessons for facing down these fears. Learn to walk the path of hope and experience the providential power of God, who, as Dr. Jeremiah explains, still controls even the smallest details of your life. Discover strength and encouragement in Hope by Dr. Jeremiah, yours for a gift of any amount. And if you give $65 or more in support of this program, Dr. Jeremiah will send you in appreciation the Living Fearlessly set, which contains his book, his current teaching series, What Are You Afraid Of?, on your choice of CD or DVD, and a correlating study guide, plus the Fear to Fear Not bookmark, which will serve as a reminder to claim hope each day. Hope and the Living Fearlessly set, yours when you give a generous gift to support the ministry of Turning Point today.
Does your devotional life need a turning point? David Jeremiah's exclusive monthly magazine and devotional may be what you're looking for. Each issue of Turning Points is centered around a unique spiritual theme based on David Jeremiah's teachings. Inside, you will find inspiring articles from David Jeremiah taken from God's Word. Study inspirational daily devotions to aid you in your quiet time with God. Discover a complete schedule of Turning Point's radio and television broadcasts so you never miss a show. Join more than 300,000 subscribers who support the ministry of Turning Point around the world. Sign up for your copy of this free monthly resource today. Connect with Turning Point on the go, anytime, anywhere. Download the newly redesigned Turning Point app to listen to Turning Point Radio, watch Turning Point Television, read daily devotionals, and more. Plus, for the young ones in your life, the new Airship Genesis Pathway to Jesus mobile game, an engaging narrative puzzle adventure game that explores the life of Jesus. Available now on the App Store. the tomb that day Just shuffling soldiers' feet as they guarded the grave One day Two days Three days had passed Could it be that Jesus had breathed his last Could it be that his father 
had forsaken him turned his back on his son despising our sin all hell seemed to whisper just forget him he's dead then the father looked down to his son and said Dr. Jeremiah wants to guide you on the path that will take you from fear to fear not in his book, Hope, Living Fearlessly in a Scary World. His message, the path to hope and to fearless living is a well-trodden one that you will take many times in your life. So it is best to learn how to walk it well. Inside this book, he does just that, directing you to take your first step to fear not, past the top seven fears holding many of us back. If you need hope, if you want to experience the providential power of our God, who controls even the smallest details of your life, then learn to move from fear to fear not in Hope by Dr. Jeremiah, yours when you give a gift of any amount in support of this program. And if you give $65 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will send you the Living Fearlessly set, which contains his book, 
his current teaching series, What Are You Afraid Of?, on your choice of CD or DVD, and a correlating study guide. Plus, the Fear to Fear Not bookmark, a powerful reminder containing scripture to help you travel each day down the path from fear to fear not. Hope and the Living Fearlessly Set, yours when you give a generous gift to support the ministry of Turning Point today. For more than three decades, David Jeremiah and Turning Point have delivered the unchanging Word of God to an ever-changing world. Through radio, books and print resources, television and online, people around the world have received the gospel, the strength and encouragement to help them through their greatest trials, and consistent Bible-strong teaching for their walk with God. And it has only been possible with the help of our Bible-strong partners, our Bible Strong Partners are dedicated supporters of David Jeremiah and Turning Point, whose gifts help Turning Point reach more souls across the globe and continue to come to you on this network. And you can join the thousands of Bible Strong Partners today. Your dedicated support will help deliver the unchanging Word of God to an ever-changing world. Plus, as a Bible Strong Partner, you will receive monthly resources handpicked by Dr. Jeremiah to encourage and strengthen your own walk with God. To become a member or to find out more information, go to davidjeremiah.org forward slash Bible Strong. Jerusalem reverberated with the aftershock. Jesus of Nazareth had just been crucified. It was national headline material. Everybody knew about this execution. Everybody had an opinion about the late homeless prophet from Galilee. His death relieved a lot of people's pressure. His presence in the temple city had disrupted and traumatized their lives. They were glad he was dead. No more trouble. Now they could go back to a normal life. Perhaps for once they could have a normal yearly Passover without the presence of this revolutionary. But for many others, 
The death of Jesus meant mourning and despair. Grief flooded their hearts. Not the grief exhibited over somebody that you love who has died, but more the grief associated with the death of a national hero. You see, they had believed in him. They had believed that he was the Messiah. They had believed and hoped and trusted that he was the coming deliverer who would free them from Roman domination. But the object of their hopes had been lifted up on a cross and forced to hang there until dead by the hand of the very Roman Empire he was supposed to conquer. And then he'd been placed in a tomb. As far as the mourners knew, he was still there. There was no bringing him back. Their hope was gone. He was dead. And they were so devastated. They were just in shock. But then on the third day, the stories began to circulate. Some said his body was not where it had been laid. Others were saying that he had risen from the dead. People reported seeing him. In fact, 10 reports altogether and five in one day alone. Early on the first Easter Sunday, he appeared to Mary Magdalene and then later to the women who were returning to the tomb. And soon after that, he showed himself to 10 of his disciples in the upper room and then to Peter all by himself. But the fifth appearance was perhaps the most astonishing of all, and it's the one I want to tell you about today. On that first Easter afternoon, as the sky darkened toward dusk, Jesus appeared to two men who were traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a two-hour journey of a bit over seven miles. These two men were disciples of Jesus among the greater group of disciples, not his 12, but perhaps the 70 disciples who were followers of Jesus. They had heard the witness of the women that Jesus had come back from the grave, but they were holding on to their doubt, and they were very sad. Why were they going to Emmaus? Well, we do not know for sure, but I can imagine they took the trip just to get away from it all. I mean, to escape Jerusalem's hopelessness, to clear their minds, maybe to go back where they lived and find a new direction for their lives. That's the human angle. But evidently God had a different purpose in mind, for on their way they would be intercepted by a mysterious stranger, and because of this encounter with this man, they would never ever be the same again. Interestingly enough, the most detailed report of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances doesn't involve Mary or Peter or any of the other known disciples. The two men who Jesus met on the road to Emmaus are people we had never met before. We know nothing about them. In fact, one of them we don't even have a name for. One was called Cleopas, whose name appears in the text here. The other one's never named. Two men, unknown, on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus has the most profound conversation with them about the resurrection than he has with anybody else in all of the history of the Bible. And I thought to myself, isn't that like our Lord? I mean, when he was born, he appeared, first of all, to the shepherds, the lowliest of people on the earth at that particular time. And now here he is, risen from the grave, and he's about to appear to two unknown men journeying alone on the road between two cities. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ comes to the meekest and the weakest of us. He's not into all of the stuff that the culture of today seems to so wonderfully love. He's not into fame. He's not into people who are important. He's into people, all people, and especially those who are seeking after the truth. The story here in Luke chapter 24 may be the most dramatic story in the Bible. In fact, it's put together like it was a play, like it was a three-act play. The first act involves two people talking together on the road. We'll call act one discouragement. And then we know further along in the play, another person joins into the dramatic presentation. So now there are three people. We'll call act two the dialogue. And the final act takes place in the home of one of these men, and we'll call that discovery. So act one, discouragement. 
Luke 24, 13 says, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. Now often discouragement is made up of three things, doubt and disappointment and despair. Doubt began the journey for these two men. They had heard the testimony of Mary Magdalene and the other women, yet they did not believe that Jesus was alive. And of course, because of that, disappointment followed their doubt. Verse 21 describes their disappointment. It says, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, and beside all this, it is now the third day since all these things happened. All of their dreams for the future had been crucified with Jesus. They had probably heard Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They believed he was the Messiah, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies, and yet now this one in whom they had invested all of their hopes had been taken to a cross and crucified, and for all that they knew, he was still dead, despite the rumors, despite the stories. Their discouragement didn't stop with doubt and disappointment. It spiraled down into despair. All hope had been abandoned. Three days had passed since the crucifixion, and there had been no credible news on which to pin any new hope. So as they walked back toward Emmaus, they were overwhelmed with sadness, and they were without hope. Act one, discouragement. Act two, dialogue. Verse 15, so it was, while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Pay attention. The plot is thickening. All of a sudden, in what appears to be the moment of their greatest despair, this mysterious man appears, and the text says he drew near, which is a New Testament expression that gives you the impression that he was walking behind them, perhaps at a distance, but at this particular moment, he sped up so that he was now walking with them alongside of them. This New Testament expression conveys that idea. Cleopas and his friend had been discussing how their hopes had been dashed by Jesus' crucifixion, and at that very moment, the topic of their discussion joins them on the road and enters into their conversation. But they did not know who he was. And verse 17 says, And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to Jesus, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and you have not known the things which happened there in these days? Are you getting the irony of this? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. When Jesus approaches Cleopas and his friend, he asks them, what has made them so sad? And Cleopas responds to Jesus' questions with one of the most ironic responses in all of the Scripture. Cleopas accuses Jesus of being a clueless outsider who missed what had just taken place in Jerusalem. <laughs> and the scene just drips with irony. We get to see what human blindness looks like from God's perspective. <laughs> and then these men proceed to tell Jesus what they believe about Jesus, still unaware that they're talking to Jesus. They confess that they believed he was a prophet. That's good. They talked about his mighty works and his words, even better. They described his suffering, his crucifixion, and their hope that he was their redeemer, but they had not yet processed the one thing they needed to believe, and that is that he was risen from the dead. In fact, it says, indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. I feel obligated right now to stop and tell you something. It is possible to be a Christian and not understand the resurrection. It is not possible to be a Christian and deny the resurrection. Because without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. 
If all we have is the death and burial of Jesus, we have nothing more than the martyrdom of another good man. If you can go any place and find the bones of Jesus and his remains, there is no such thing as Christianity. What sets